Hello, this is Marvin Glossfelty with another industry connected video uh, from the National Groundwater Association. And today I want to talk to you about for well designers and consultants like myself. It's really uh, focused on you and to interact with folks like myself or you uh, water well drillers out there. This uh, is about a friend of mine that had contacted me with some frustration because a consultant, not in my state, but in an adjacent state, had contacted him about a job and he had specified a particular drilling method. And that particular drilling method wasn't the best for the location where they were drilling the well. It wasn't best for the hydrogeology. And uh, that's part of what goes into well design. <clears throat> so it warrants a little discussion. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and then uh, bring up a, a PowerPoint here. So if we consider, you know, a bunch of typical types of drilling methods, um, here's some, it's not every type, but it's uh, a number of them. So we have direct mud rotary, direct air rotary, flooded reverse circulation, often used for larger and deeper uh, large production wells, say 16 or 18 inch or 20 inch casing diameters, dual rotary, cable tool, bucket auger, and hollow stem auger. So I want to just briefly go through these just to point out the issue I'm talking about, where if you think of these drilling methods in terms of the local hydrogeology and the challenges it presents, then that might be a direction of what you want to consider. You don't always have to exclusively specify one drilling method. You can have either or, but then, you know, as well designers, we either call for the process or we call for the results. And if you're giving an either or to the drilling method, that's when you call for the result. Like, however you want to drill it, but it has to be this deep and this diameter and have these attributes. And so we were thinking about, as we design a well, the end of the game, the end well, you know, what will be installed and developed and be able to produce. So let's first look at these first two, direct mud rotary and air rotary. In the case I'm talking about, here I'm showing a mud rotary uh, drill bed where in mud filled hole being advanced. Um, this is this is no problem. We we use the drilling fluid to circulate the cuttings out so it can advance the borehole and so on. So what if we have a porous formation? A if it's a rock aquifer, it could be a big fractured zone. If it's a alluvial aquifer. It might be a gravel or a cobble zone or just a porous sand. This is going to be a trouble zone because it's unstable and it'll allow our fluids to seep out into it. So as we circulate down the drill pipe and up the annulus with direct circulation, what can happen is some of this fluid may not make it to the land surface. It may seep out into this porous zone. That's called lost circulation. Well, that means we aren't getting the cuttings out. We are liable to uh, lose our hydraulic head and um, therefore our stability of the borehole. There's a lot of problems that can result from lost circulation. And to fix it, we add, the driller adds lost circulation material, which stabilizes the borehole. But what lost circulation material is, is materials that clog off the pore spaces. They clog off the pore spaces so that the fluid will no longer flow out to that adjacent formation. And that's a good thing while you're drilling, but later in time, when you're trying to make the well produce, now you have lost circulation material, things like cellophane or mica flakes or things like that that will, that will clog off a, a porous zone. Well, those have to be removed and that is sometimes difficult to do. So if we have very porous formations like this, maybe direct mud rotary is not the best process if that's part of the zone that we're gonna eventually screen and try to produce groundwater from, because now we're clogging off our producing zone. So, so what other alternatives are there? I'll go through a few of them. One, one way to go at it would be to switch to direct air rotary. Well, now it's not usually just dry air that's being circulated down the drill pipe and up the annulus to remove the cuttings. There's almost always some water added, so that's mist drilling, or can add some um, soap, so we have foam drilling, 
comes out sort of like uh, what you shampooed your hair with this morning. Or if you add polymer to that, then it's stiff foam. That's more like shaving cream. And if you visualize that floating up this borehole, it acts as a fluid like the drilling mud, except for it's very light and very high viscosity. So it can kind of, if you will, float those cuttings out to the surface. And even though it may tend to go out into this porous gravel zone, it won't do it quite as much. So that's a good thing. And maybe you can solve the problem of law circulation, but there may be other problems that we also have to think about. So the other problem is what happens with air rotary drilling? We drill down a drill pipe, a 20 foot or so, and then we have to make a connection. We have to add another section of drill pipe. And that means that we have to turn off the air compressor. So we've lost the positive pressure head inside this borehole. And what can happen is formation can slough in, get us stuck. We don't want that. So we have to consider everything that could happen. We really should anyway, when we're designing a well to start with, like when we're gonna call out a drilling method, we need to think about what problems the driller may have. So it goes to, you may sometimes hear the term of, the term of constructability. Well, you can design something really fancy and intricate, but if it can't be built, then what good is it? So you have to make it where it's really achievable for a driller and, and, and empathize with these drillers. They're oftentimes in a low bid situation. They have to do the specified work at the lowest cost possible. So we have to enable them to do it. And so that's part of what really goes into well design. So that's, that's the two. Let me now talk about flooded reverse. We use this for larger diameter boreholes, maybe up to a couple of feet in diameter. And this has the advantage that we can circulate fluids. This also would be uh, similar to drilling. Uh, it could be uh, mud. Uh, it's, it, it can be uh, air, but it's usually flooded with clear water or something close to it to the land surface. So we have a positive pressure head and we will have fluids therefore going out into a, a gravel formation like I'm showing here but we're gonna be able to add fluid faster than the, the earth takes it. So we can keep the borehole open and those cuttings aren't gonna to try to go up this large diameter borehole. They're gonna come up the middle of the drill pipe because we have the reverse circulation direction going on. So that means that by airlifting within the middle of the drill pipe, we're just removing those cuttings, no problem. And we can continue to advance the borehole with less likelihood of needing to add uh, lost circulation material, although we still need to add it in, in uh, it's not rare to have to add some lost circulation material to uh, boreholes like this. We always want to minimize it, but we have to do it to, to advance the borehole when needed. So what if it's more extreme yet? Now we can go to a casing advance method and the next two talk about that. The first one is dual rotary. That's where we have the casing itself is welded together as we go we have tungsten carbide inserts buttons at the bottom of it, as you see here. And then our drill bit is independently rotated. It's within it. So we have two rotating heads on the drill rig and we can rotate the casing. We can rotate the drill bit independent of one another. So we can advance that casing as we advance the borehole and basically seal off problem formations like I'm showing with this gravel. So that's a good thing. What's the challenge to this? Well, the challenge is you often have to have a telescoping casing getting from larger diameter to smaller to smaller to smaller because as you're spinning a casing advancing it down into the earth you build up a huge amount of torque and so that becomes a problem that you have to overcome by going to a smaller diameter and a smaller diameter so we're talking about a lot of steel for one thing and then if we advance it all the way to the bottom if we're going to now complete the well, we, we have to do one of two things. We either have to perforate the casing and just leave it without a filter pack, which means we may have sanding problems in our completed well, or we can pull out that casing after we've installed a smaller diameter well screen and filter pack simultaneously with pulling out the larger dual rotary casing. That gives a big opportunity for sand locking between the two casing screens, the, the smaller diameter screen and the larger diameter dual rotary casing. That's called a pullback completion. And it's done all the time, but it is tricky. So you have to be sure that the driller is knows that they're getting into that and that they're comfortable with that approach, because that is 
Uh, having done that a few times, I know that that is achievable, but requires a high level of skill from that driller and, and it's tricky. It, it's not without risk. So that's one type of a casing advanced drilling method, dual rotor, and it's good for areas of bad loss circulation. Another one that I've got checked here is cable tool. Similar in that we're advancing casings, but very different in the drilling method. In this case, we've got our cable tool rig with just a cable, no, no drill pipe involved, um, where we can, we can pulverize the formation and bail out the cuttings. As we do that to stabilize the borehole, if it's coming in on us, we use uh, basically with just a pile driver type method, we'll drive with a drive chute at the base, a casing as we go. So we can stabilize formations as I'm showing in the cartoon here, but uh, here again, same challenges. We have to remember that we may need to telescope the casing diameter if we run into difficulties, and we may need to do a pullback completion or incur a sanding type well if we have to just cut mill, mill knife cuts in this well casing after it's been driven to the base. So there's limitations to these, but they can address the situation depending on what our local hydrogeology challenges are for us. The next two are auger drilling methods. Now with this, um, we have auger flights that mechanically remove the cuttings, so we're not circulating fluids to do it. Well, with a hollow stem auger or a bucket auger, we can uh, advance a borehole pretty readily through most formations except for hard rock, but uh, there's depth limitations. And there's also an extensive amount of wall cake. So remember that wall cake is the pulverized fine material that sticks to the borehole wall that is stabilizes it while we're drilling, but we later need to remove that material. So as these auger flights are spinning and spinning, we have a whole lot of uh, pulverized material driven into that borehole face. And so it's, it's, it's gonna be problematic to remove it later when we do well development. And in the case of a bucket auger, they can't do much more than 100 feet or so in depth. Uh, even though they can do very large diameters, that's just not what they're designed for. Uh, hollow stem augers, I'm not aware of anything deeper than about 300 feet for those. Most commonly, uh, 200 feet or less are their depth limitations. And so we do have those depth limitations. If we're in a location where the water table is shallow enough, that's fine. We can use these to install water wells. But otherwise, and these are both in, used commonly for environmental work, for geotechnical work, and in the case of the bucket auger, for large diameter holes like surface casings and caissons and so on. So, so there's no right or wrong. It's just that we need to think about which correct drilling uh, uh, method matches our anticipated hydrogeology and call for that, and then work with the driller to make sure that they can they can uh, do the work that we're called out and reach the result that we want to get to, and then the well becomes constructible, and that's that's the goal that we want. And with that, I thank you, and uh, I hope you I hope you're staying safe and. Uh, designing good wells, and I'll talk to you next time.